Amen. Glory church. Amazing singing. Amazing. Oh man, I tell you, yeah. don't let don't let anybody know who's up here singing before they change their minds to take you all back. No take backs. No do overs. No take backs. No take backsies. It is can't triple stamp or double stamp. It is done. All right. <laughs> it is done. It is finished. It is written. Uh, good morning. Morning. Now, I'm really excited. I'm really excited about this lesson, and uh, you know, I just really uh, been excited just about walking with God, and uh, that's really my prayer, my hope this morning, is to inspire you. And again, whether you're here for the first time or whether you know you've been you know on riding a spiritual high or you've been feeling a little bit uh, down or off spiritually, uh, I think this lesson is going to be appropriate for all of us. And there's something in here for each of us, and uh, it's about walking with God. And, uh, you know, I kind of want to open it up with a, a, a cool little story here about a, about a, a man who came, uh, he came home from work one day and uh, he found his dog sitting on the back porch, the balcony, you know, like the back patio. And uh, as he got closer, a little closer, um, he noticed that his dog was sitting there and he had something in its mouth and as he got closer, he realized it was a rabbit. And just kind of freaked out in horror, he noticed the, the rabbit and instantly in his mind. He realized uh, it was his neighbor's rabbit that his, his neighbors and their children were raising prized rabbits. They were blue ribbon, award winning rabbits. Oh, and so immediately the anxiety just shoots through his body. It's like, oh my goodness, what did Rover do? <laughs> so as he gets close to it, he gets the rabbit out of the dog's mouth and he sees that he's like stiff and covered in dirt, but he's not bleeding. There's no blood. And so. Uh, trying to figure out how to remedy the situation, he takes, you know, he takes the rabbit, he washes it, and cleans it up to the best of his abilities. In his mind, he's thinking, man, you know, you know, some animals, when they're captured by a bigger animal, they play dead. So he's like, all right, he's playing dead. Let me wash him up, and let me run over and put him back, and he put the rabbit back in the rabbit cages in his next-door neighbor's uh, enclosure. Comes back home. And hoping for the best, 30 minutes later, he is screams and crying from next door. So he comes running next door, trying to be surprised at, hey, what's, what's wrong? And uh, his neighbors are, are just freaking out. They're like, oh my goodness, three days ago, our rabbit died and we buried it. And now, <laughs> it's back in the hay cage. <laughs> That has nothing to do with the lesson. <laughs> no. I just thought it was a funny, I thought it was a very funny story. <laughs> and uh, it been a really good story for like Easter Sunday. Because <laughs> on the yeah. third day, right. yeah. Yeah. that's where the Easter Sunday comes from. Yeah. Um, wow. You know, so it has nothing to do with the lesson. There's, really no, there's no scripture to tie to that. I just thought it was a funny story. Sometimes you just you get, you need to laugh. Thank you, Bob. And so I hope that it tickled you in the same way that it tickled me. And so, uh, the title of today's lesson, we're going to start taking notes here, it's uh, Keys to Faith and Joy in God's Kingdom. Keys to Faith and Joy in God's Kingdom. And, uh, you know, I think sometimes one of the keys to finding joy is you gotta, you got to laugh. you got to find things to laugh at, you know. you got to laugh at, you know, I, I really love that there's this funny movie called uh, Zombie, Zombie Land or something like that. And it says, you know, one of the, they got all these rules on how to survive the zombie apocalypse. And one of the rules is you got to enjoy the little things. And so there's this one guy, Woody Harrelson's character, he's like searching for like the last Twinkie on Earth. Yeah. You know, because it's civil, civilization, the last thing they think about is making more Twinkies. And so he's on a search for the, the, the last Twinkie. And uh, so he's always uh, kind of enjoy finding a way to enjoy the little things while you know there's all this mayhem and catastrophe around him. And a lot like the like a lot like the red story, uh, we have to find joy in life. Amen. You know, even in the world, you know, the, the world outside of the kingdom of God, people are looking to find joy. They're looking to find happiness and all sorts of different things. They're trying to find their joy and fulfillment in their jobs. And so they pursue education and careers and advancement and increasing salaries, and increasing prominence, and increasing their uh, earning capacity. And, and those things are, are great, and those things are good. There's nothing inherently good or evil about them, but there's a there's a lack of substance and a lack of meaning in, 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 in just simply working to pay the bills. Amen? And, and, and you know, it's interestingly enough, I've I found that at times when I've had the least, 
there are those are some of the happiest times and most content times in my life. And then I've had times where I've had the most and been completely miserable and, and, and anxiety fields. Can, you know, can anyone relate to that? Oh, yeah. Not, not saying that, you know, being successful was a sin. I know some very happy, wealthy people. But it's not the key to happiness. Uh, let's turn in our, in our Bibles here to Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 2. And uh, looking at, you know, the, the wisdom books in the Bible, um, uh, King Solomon writes extensively. He, he, he set out to do an exhaustive analysis on really the purpose and the meaning of life. And, 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 and uh, you know, if you're new to the Bible, uh, one of the things that's unique about Solomon, Solomon is, uh, according to the Bible, the wisest and the wealthiest king ever on the face of the earth. Um, and and, and I, I did some estimates based on... Uh, you know, cattle and gold, and different things like that, and how that would equate to uh, our kind of income. And to my best estimate, his wealth was somewhere in the realm of four times that of, of that of Bill Gates. Wow. And so it's like Bill Gates as well, those guys, their, their wealth is kind of like hard for us to even fathom. Well, Solomon's wealth is beyond that. Wow. So it's like money wasn't a thing for him. Women wasn't a thing. And either the beautiful women, any beautiful woman that he wanted was at his disposal. Anything that the earth could provide, he could have, he had it. And in his extensive research on what it meant to be happy, I'm still trying to get there myself here. Who forgive me? He says here, a person, in verse 24, in summary, he says, a person can do no better than to find satisfaction in their toy, which is their work, their purpose in life. And he goes on to say at the end of that verse, he says, this is from the hand of God. It's meaning simply that to even find joy and contentment in what you do, it really depends on the hand of God giving you true joy and your purpose. Does that make sense, guys? And as he concludes it out at the end of the chapter, at the end of the, the, the book in chapter 12, and he says, this is the conclusion of the matter. He did all his research and he just went through everything. He said, oh, you know what? I explore wisdom. Because I figure, okay, if you're smart, you'll be happy. So he explored all the wisdom that the world had to give. And he said, okay, see what that had to offer. He said, okay, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to study out foolishness. I'm just going to be an idiot and see where that leads. And I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm going to take care of my body and eat the finest foods. And then I'm also going to examine debauchery. I'm gonna, and I'm going to eat in excess and I'm going I'm to get drunk. Let me see what, and I'm gonna study out drunkenness. Just, just a beta test it. See how that works out. <laughs> and so he examined, he examined everything. Wow. You know, he said, "Oh, let me, let me, let me, let me start. Let me, let me building architects. Let me build the, the, the temples and palaces and and, 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 and construct great things uh, to, to enhance my legacy." And then, and he realized that sadness came over him because of all his work that he labored for, labored for under the sun. He says, "Man, I'm doing all this work." In labor and his toil, and I don't even know if the person who is going to inherit my labor is going to be a fool or not. If that person is going to be wise. What they're going to do with everything that I'm laboring for under the sun. And he said, and he said, and, and he basically said, and I, and I became depressed. Wow. I became down because everything that my life that I'm working for and seeking to hold on to, it, once I leave here, none of that comes with me, and none of it can I control. I didn't, nothing was lost, and nothing was gained. And uh, he studied out the matter, and at the end of the at the end of the, end of it all, he said, "This is the conclusion of the matter, and of the greatest value is to fear God and keep His command commandments." And I think that's a very important proposition for us: is that what is the source of true happiness? Obviously, we're here on Sunday, we're reading the Bible, and uh, we realize that you know we, we are we're here trying to find a spiritual fulfillment. And what spiritual fulfillment and where spiritual fulfillment can be found can only be found in our relationship with God. And in the heart of the matter, number one, is do we fear God? Now, fearing God doesn't mean hiding in the bed, quivering in fear, ducking lightning bolts. Fearing God means do you, do you have God in the proper context, in the proper perspective, the proper place in your life, a place of honor, a place of reverence? A place of respect. Or do you value what you can do with your hands in this life? Your 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years. And then you're gone. 
and who knows what the wise person or the fool will do with your work after you're done. See, that's what the Bible teaches is that our true fulfillment, our true purpose is found in connecting with God. Let's go to Psalm 51. Psalm 51. And uh, give a little bit of context to uh, to this passage here. Um, you know, this is written in light of King David, one of the low points of his life. Uh, he really he really blundered and he committed a grievous sin. He committed a, adultery. Uh, but not just committing adultery, but he committed adultery betraying one of his best friends. He committed adultery with his best friend's wife. And then, he, and then to cover it up, he had to um, murder. And uh, because uh, he committed adultery and conceived the baby. And uh, since he couldn't cover it up, he had his best friend killed. And in verse 10, and basically this chapter, he's basically dealing with the consequences and, and how and how he had lived to he lived to fulfill his flesh, right? He saw a beautiful woman. He figured that would bring me joy, and he chose the joy of the physical pleasure rather than the joy of the relationship that he had with God. And he says here in verse ten, he says to create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me, but restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. See, he realized here he, he, he had erred and, and chose to pursue and fulfill the lust of his flesh and he had abandoned his relationship with God. He chose, he chose what was lesser rather than holding on to what was greater. And now he was feeling the consequences of that because it, it, his choice separated him from God. And, 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 and he lost his joy. Isn't that crazy? Sometimes you ever see something in the world that you just, I, I'm, just I'm just not content until I have it. You know what I'm talking about? And you, and you lose your peace. You lose your sleep over it. You know, it affects your attitude and your mood. And, and even to the point where you can't even pray. You can't even acknowledge the good that God has done and is doing in your life, even sustaining your very life. And so what you do is that, that, that creates a wedge between us and God, and then we give in and we pursue those things to the flesh, and then we look up and, and, and we're dissatisfied, yeah. we're unfulfilled, we're empty, and we're broken. And then in that, in that brokenness, and, and that's a, brokenness is a great thing. Finding brokenness is a great thing. I think that's the that's the upside about this passage that David realized because he had a great friend that pointed it out to him where he was. He got broken about where he was, and he decided to turn back to God. And God, I need you. I realize I'm not fulfilled. I, I I turned away from what was better to pursue what was lesser, and I'm empty, and I'm broken, and I and I need you. And he's asking God here to create in him a pure heart. To renew his spirit, to give God, give him, give for God to give him his spirit again, to sustain him, and give him back his joy. And I think that's one of the things that's so important. I'm so excited to teach about here. Again, these are these are keys to finding faith and joy in your walk with God. And I think the spiritual principle that's taught here is that. Even though there is good and joy to be found in the physical world, the spiritual world trumps the physical world. Yeah. And I think if you understand that, I think it'll help us put our whole lives in the context. And I think that it'll help us to find a deeper and a richer happiness than we've ever known was possible. And I think that what the enemy, Satan, is trying to convince us of is that happiness is found in the other direction. Yeah. That happiness is found in the pursuit of, of the highest degree in this world while neglecting the benefits and the fruit of the spiritual world. And then and then and, and he tries to keep us trapped in that in that thinking until we're taken out and we leave this world separated from God rather than united with him. Amen? Yeah. You know, 
there's a great joy. I think one of the things I'm so excited about, and, and I'm, I'm excited to preach this morning, because I just really, um, and, and, and I'm preaching to myself. Um, I, I'm really, even in my own life, working to go after um, a deeper understanding of, of God, and a deeper understanding of spiritual things, and, 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 uh, and finding joy in exploring the depth of a relationship with God. Uh, turn to Romans 11. Romans 11 and verse 33. And, uh, you know, I, I'm gonna, I, I don't know about you guys, but I, I'm gonna, I, I like to explore. Come on, man. You know, I, 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 I hate when things get stagnant. I get bored really easily. And so things need to be moving, things need to be changing. I, I, I like to discover and grow and love love. Okay? I'm not a play it safe kind of guy, but come on. <laughs> and, uh, you know, hang around and you'll see. And, uh, and what it says here in verse 33 of Romans 11, it says, All oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his past beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. And the church says, Amen. Amen. You know, this scripture is exciting to me because it says the ways of the Lord are what? Unsearchable. They're without limits. Meaning that you can spend an entire lifetime trying to understand and discover just one aspect of God, and in your lifetime, you would never even scratch the surface of the depth of the wisdom of God, and the depth of the ways of God, the power of God. And so for an explorer, that's an exciting proposition. That I've, not, I've never, like, I think the best way I like to, to explain to you that you may not think that you're an explorer, I'm going to prove you're an explorer. What, what's your, think about your favorite series that you watch on Netflix. Do not say it out loud, stick by it. <laughs> right? And, and uh, raise your hand if you've ever binge watched a series okay. on Netflix. Okay. Or binge watched, or binge read, or binge ate. Something. Okay? <laughs> and so, and so you, know, you know that feeling. You know that feeling of whatever that thing is that you're binging on? When it runs out, how do you feel? Empty. Sad. Yeah. Sad. <laughs> Discouraged. What is, what is life? <laughs> what does it mean to be a human? Right? You know, or, or, or I think of like a, a great a great series or a great show that ultimately has to come to an end. Right? And then when it comes to an end, and you're like, you know, empty, no matter how good the ending was, you're just never satisfied because you just want a little bit more. Because the story, the entry, what's going to happen next? What happens to these people and, the, and that, that character or this situation? And and and, and if, it, if it's a, and that's if it's a good ending. If it's a bad ending, then it's like it just ruins your life. And you hate that you ever watch this shit. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so much time. And so, searching God is a lifetime pursuit. So you are explorers by nature. It's in, your, it's in you. It's in your DNA. It's in your spirit to explore. And I want to encourage you and invite you on this adventure of exploring the nature of God. Who He is, and how does He relate to you? How does He relate to us? And I want to inspire you that you will never exhaust the possibilities of exploring God. Now, we can sit here all morning and think of a thousand different ways that we can explore God. I'm just going to focus on just three, okay? Focus on three this morning. And so number one is kind of like three in one, so bear with me. So number one is that we're going to explore His mercy, love, and affection for us. That's all one. Mercy, love, and affection. I'm going to tie it all in there. Okay? Exploring the possibilities of God's mercy, His love, and His affection for us. I think the second thing that we're going to touch on is we're going to explore the depths of the wisdom of God. Because I think that, you know, wisdom for us is so important because if you don't, without wisdom, you know, you can really hurt yourself. Without wisdom, right? You know, you try working on your car without wisdom mm -hmm. and see what happens. You know, um, the wheels will fall. <laughs> you know, um, try changing the oil in your engine without a little bit of wisdom. 
they're realizing that you know you need to change the oil filter as well as the oil. Or when you or when you drain the oil, you put the cap back. Okay, <laughs> 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 it takes wisdom. It takes wisdom, you know. You haven't really learned how to change the oil until so you change the oil and forget how to put the cap back on. You do that once, you never forget to do it again. Right? <laughs> That's wisdom. Right? And you know, but without wisdom you can really hurt yourself in the physical world, in the practical things, but it, it, the same is true of spiritual things. If you don't have wisdom and you're trying to pursue God, and you're trying to be spiritual, without wisdom, you'll hurt yourself and you'll hurt people. Wow. Spiritual. And so we want to pursue the endless possibilities and the depth that and wisdom that God provides to us. And lastly, we want to explore the possibilities of the Holy Spirit, which is the most powerful force in the universe. The Holy Spirit by which all things were created and moves and breathes in every living being on the planet. You know, the only limit that we have in exploring these things is our imagination. So I, I, that excites me. So the only limit is our imagination and our desire <coughs> for more. And as Jesus says in Matthew 7, he says, you know, ask and it will be given. Knock and the door will be open. Right? Seek in your finds. And so God is not stingy in any of these respects in his willingness to give to us. And James, one of my favorite New Testament writers, he writes, you don't have, because why? No. You don't ask, you don't ask God. Mm-hmm. It's the only reason why we don't have a joy and increasing faith in our walk with God is not because it's not available, it's not because it's not abundant, but because we haven't yet asked. And so I hope today to help us to go deeper. Amen. Uh, let's turn our Bibles here. Point number one is the objects of his affection. Point number one, the objects of his affection. Yeah, I think that's a that's a huge key in seeing the magnitude of God's mercy and love for us is his willingness to display his affection to us as a rebellious people. Let's, let's turn to Ezekiel chapter 34. Ezekiel chapter 34. And I really, I really appreciate you know Thomas' communion there. And uh, he said something so powerful if you were paying attention. He said that there's no part of me that belongs in heaven. That's the most powerful thing I've heard in a long time. There's no part of me, there's no part of us that belongs in heaven. Wow. Now our spirit was designed for heaven, but the state of our spirit without God does not belong in heaven, which is why we're here. Yeah. Amen? And so I think that's a very powerful self-revelation. I think that we all should come to, and it helps us to have the proper humility that we have even when we come to God in the first place. Amen? That we're not doing God a favor by coming being at church this morning. <laughs> Amen? Wow. Well, yeah, I'm just going to show up for God. I'm going to help you out. And I'm going to pray to you guys so you can feel good and sing these songs. I hope you appreciate it. Yes. And uh, to God be the glory. Wow. And uh, when you realize, no, man, the fact that he even hears my songs <laughs> is, 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 is great mercy. And uh, a great privilege, amen. And uh, in Ezekiel 34, let's uh, let's jump down to verse 15 here. We're gonna read a little bit, and then we're gonna talk. And uh, uh, the Bible says here, it says, "I myself will send my sheep and have them lie down to close the sovereign Lord. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak, put the sleek and the strong." I will destroy, I will shepherd the flock with justice. Let me stop right there for a second. That's the powerful thing here. This is this is a great breakdown of who we are without God. And just to give you a little context for this, is that this is in light of God's people being rebellious and actually turning their backs on God. And he describes the people as an adulterous wife. Everybody knows what adultery is, right? You're married, you make a vow, and you break it. And you you are unfaithful, um, bringing another lover, another first love, in spite of your first love. Amen? 
And uh, what it shows here is that in spite of that, God's holiness, so no, no, so there's no part in an adulterer really has no right to to the, the marital rights anymore because they've broken the vow. And so really the the, 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 the the spouse has every reason to reject the adulteress or the adulterer. Are you guys hanging in there with me? And yet you see here God's willingness yet still to bring them back and lavish his affection on his loved ones. And to, and to restore them. And that's why I appreciate man, that. I think it's that great point. There's no part of us that belongs in the presence of God. Yet still, God is willing to bring us back here. Look what it says here in, in uh, verse 15. He says, I myself will tend my sheep. So God's going he to he's gonna do it himself. And he says, I will search for the lost and bring back the strays, bind up the injured, and strengthen the weak. See, this is what happens to us outside of a relationship with God is that we get injured we get weak and we go astray and so God is willing to heal us you know and I, th I can think of many times in my life where I've gone after things that I thought would make me happy in spite of a relationship with God and I hurt myself and I've injured myself or I, I or I've gotten sick spiritually anybody can relate to me mm -hmm. And, 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 then, uh, and then my back is against the wall, I hit rock bottom, and then I look back up and say, oh, I'm oh God. I'm sorry. I see where I'm, I'm not in a good place, and I, actually I was better off with you. If it's all right, I'd like to come home. And then God heals me up. And he binds me up. And he gets me back on the path. But then as the second part of this passage here, after strengthening the weak, Kind of part B of verse 16 it says but the sleek and the strong i will destroy i will shepherd the flock with justice and i'm like why would he destroy the strong ones and the sleek ones and remember this is within the context of god's people betraying god and, and committing adultery and so there's two kind of ways that we can see this drifting away from god we can see that we're injured we're weak and sick we can see that we've strayed and gotten lost, or in our pride, we can walk around sleek and strong in our self-reliance. And so, God, in his justice, will bring destruction and judgment on those in their pride who don't even acknowledge their adultery against God. Wow. And so God is wanting, it's just a simple, it's, it's, it's true as the scriptures say, it's that God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And I preach, that's, what, that's really what communion is all about. That's what it is when we come and take the bread that represents his body and the juice that represents his blood. It's coming before God, recognizing that there's no part of us that belongs in the presence of God, and yet he's still willing to, to heal us and mend us and make us okay to be with him. And he's lavishing his mercy. He's lavishing his grace, his love. He's lavishing his affections. This is what happens when we come back. Let's jump down to verse 25. Verse 25 says, I'll make a covenant of peace with them and rid the land of savage beasts so that they will live in the wilderness and sleep in the forest in safety. You know, there's a lot of wilderness in New Hampshire, man. A lot of wild animals. I saw, I saw this beaver and he just looked vicious. Right? <laughs> He's, he's a couple pounds overweight. You gotta watch out. <laughs> Those overweight beavers. Come on. He's <laughs> keeping me safe from the vicious wildlife that surrounds us in New Hampshire. Okay? <laughs> Verse 26, he says, I will make them and the places surrounding my hill a blessing. I will send down showers in season, and there will be showers of blessing. The trees will yield their fruit, and the ground yield its crops. The people will be secure in their land. They will know that I am the Lord. See, when, 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 when we realize and we recognize our need for God and we come back to Him, he, he wants to lavish us. We become the objects of His affection. And all He's looking for us to do is not to, to reject the affection that He wants to give us. So really, our judgment that we face when we're away from Him is not even God necessarily bringing His wrath on us. He said, okay, you 
You want to be free and sovereign? Have at it. And see how see how things go without the hedge around you. When the when the savage beasts and the rabid beavers come <laughs> and attack. You know, I really love this. this I'm having a great Bible, great Bible study here. Let's go. To, let's come over one chapter to verse 36 here. I mean, chapter 36. Turn a couple pages. Chapter 36. And, uh, verse 35. No, verse 33. We have a good Bible study this morning. I hope you're ready. Alright? Verse 33. So this is what the Sovereign Lord says. On the day I cleanse you from all your sins, I will resettle your towns. And the ruins will be rebuilt. The desolate land will be cultivated instead of lying desolate in the sight of all who pass through it. They'll say, this land that was laid waste has become like the Garden of Eden. It's like we restored like it was in the beginning without sin. Verse 36, the nations around you that remain will know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt what was destroyed and have replanted what was desolate. Verse 37, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. Once again, I will yield to Israel's plea to do this for them. I will make their people as numerous as sheep. Now, this is pretty interesting here. The word sovereign. Sovereignty is a word that means tra transcendent. Meaning that God is, is always fully in control. Nothing catches him by surprise. Nothing derails his plans. In his sovereignty, he, al he either allows things to happen or he stops them from happening. Are you guys with me? So uh, but even within the context of our free will, so without imposing on our ability to choose, God's plans always come, come to fruition, one way or the other. And so he either allows us to do things that will lead to our destruction because we choose to reject God, or he, or he keeps things back to protect us when we decide to come to him. But what I love here in verse 37 here, it says, once again, I will yield to Israel's plea. See, when we're the objects of God's affection, the sovereign God is willing to yield to who? To us. God is willing to yield to our plea because he has a deep love, great mercy, and immense affection for his people. And really, all he's asking for us is to turn to him and to accept his love and to seek his face. So I think that that's cause for great joy in our relationship with God. And then just recognizing that I don't, we don't deserve the love that he's giving to us, but he's going to give it anyway. And I think that's a great God. I think on a practical note, I think that's what will help us as we share our faith in the cancer. Just on a, on a practical level, David says in Psalm 51, he says, Restore to me the joy of my salvation. Renew in me a steadfast spirit. He says, and then I will teach sinners your ways. Wow. And bring them to you. See, when we have the joy of our salvation, when we find a brokenness before God and the humility before God, it allows us to joyfully teach people about God. And so I think that's the uh, appropriate for us to have as point number one is that our relationship with God, our joy in God, comes from understanding the mercy of God. Amen? Mm -hmm. Point number two. And uh, we're going to turn to Matthew chapter 6. Um, In Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, we're going to park there. One second. Point number two is the depths of his wisdom. The depths of his wisdom. And I think what's important to understand key number two to growing in our faith and our joy and our relationship with God is that as we search the depths of God's wisdom, it leaves us in awe of God. It leaves us in awe of God and it reveals not only God's true nature, 
are really discovering our own. I think many of us are lacking joy in our life on this earth because we don't really understand our true identities. You don't know who you are. And because you don't know who you are, you don't know what to pursue. You don't know what's a meaningful pursuit until you understand the purpose of your life and who you are. Matthew chapter 6. I'm not even there myself. So carry away. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. This is the Bible reads. It says, Therefore I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you eat, or about your body. What you wear is not life more than food in the body more than clothes. I'm going to stop right here. This is a passage that we're very familiar with. And if you're not, I, I would encourage you to study out chapter 6, verse 25 and 33. And Jesus is teaching here, and he's saying very simply, don't worry about your life. Which is so counter culture. Right? Our culture is totally what? <laughs> worry about your life. Right? Hold on, what do you mean? YOLO. You only live once. What do you mean don't worry about your life? I only got one. Jesus says the opposite. Jesus says, no, don't, don't worry about your life. Don't worry about what you eat or what you drink or what you wear. And then he asks this great question. He says, is not life more than what? Food. It's not life more than food. We'll get back to that. He's giving us a call here in verse 33 to seek first his kingdom. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And so this is a very important biblical principle to understand your identity. Who are you? He's giving us a call to kingdom citizenship. Are we living as citizens of whose kingdom? The kingdom of God. So there's a difference. There are kingdoms on earth. There are nations on earth. There are forces on earth. And then there's the nation and the kingdom of God. And so Jesus gives first priority to what? The kingdom of God. He said, seek first this kingdom and he's asking a very important question I want to pose to you today. Are you a citizen of the kingdom? And are you living as a citizen of the kingdom of God? You know, we've got some uh, we've got some friends on uh, Aaron and Charmaine that they're traveling to Nigeria, they went to Lagos, Nigeria. In order to get to Nigeria, what do you need? <laughs> you need a visa, right? And so you need money. And so, so what, but what is a what is a visa? Again, that's, 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 that's a good point, right? You need to exchange the currency, right? You, you need Nigerian dollars, or you need to convert it somehow, right? I'll hold up to that, right? So most nations, they have embassies, or they have consulates, so that if you want to travel abroad, you can get a visa to have permission, legally, to go to that nation. Are you guys with me? So, so in a spiritual sense, we are citizens of a spiritual kingdom. Living in a physical kingdom, not as natural born citizens, but living as foreigners. We're living as visitors. You, you want me to prove want me to prove it? I'll prove it. So what happens to your visa eventually? It expires. It expires. And then that would can you stay there? No. Eventually, what happened when your visa expires? What do you have to do? Leave. You have to leave. You have to go where you came from. You have to go home. So, what happens to us as 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 visitors in a physical kingdom? What's our passport in the physical kingdom? Our bodies. <laughs> See, our bodies are our visa to to, to exist <laughs> and to visit the physical world where we live. And so you don't believe me, try to take your body with you when you die. <laughs> what happens to your body when you die? It stays in your spirit. Does it die? No, your spirit never dies. Where, where it resides from that point is a whole other Bible study, but it never dies. Your spirit is a temporary visa. So why do we live for the temporary when our citizenship is in the eternal? See, that's the challenge of what the question, are you living as a citizen of the kingdom? If you don't know who you are, and you don't know where you're a citizen of, you can be fighting for the wrong place. And fighting to live and enhance your position in the wrong nation. 
rather than the one that you're designed for. You guys with me this morning? Uh, Am I going too deep? You need another cup of coffee. No, 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 no. All right, good stuff. So all nations have a domain or realm. So what does that have to do with what we're talking about this morning, Renel? Uh, understanding our identity is that Earth, what is Earth to citizens of God? It's a foreign country we're visiting. We, as disciples of Jesus, are citizens of a spiritual kingdom. For your Bible study, write down these scriptures here. Hebrews 11, 13 through 16. Say this out on your own, but don't take my word for it. And what it reads simply is that people of faith, if it applies, people of faith, recognize you are not fully at home in this world. You should live like strangers or aliens because in faith you hope for a better life, a heavenly one. That's Hebrews 11. First Peter chapter 2, verse 11, another great Bible study scripture on your own time. Peter writes, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts. Meaning don't allow your, your flesh to control how you live, but live as an alien that you got to go back home to where you're from eventually. In Romans 12, verse 1. Romans 12, verse 1 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So the, the key to point number two is in exploring the wisdom of God, it reveals the true nature of God, but it also reveals our true nature. This should totally, understanding this concept should change your Bible study. Understand this concept to change your whole dynamic and how you view God and how you view your own life. Because you're, you're living based on your citizenship, not based on your visa. Come on, we have temporary visas in a foreign country. We need to live as citizens of a spiritual kingdom. The final point, point number three, tying into all this is, is that we're the vessels of the Spirit. One of the things that we need to explore in finding faith and joy in our relationship with God is that we are the vessels of God's Spirit. And again, I, I don't think I can emphasize this enough. Understanding this will change your life. Understanding this will change your life. It'll change your Bible study. It'll change how you look at the scriptures. You're a spirit dwelling in a body. I like you to repeat after me. I'm a spirit. 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 See, you're a spirit dwelling in a body. Right? Even the word human. The word human is a two-part word. H-U is short for humans. Which means what, farmers? Dirt. Right? And the second part of human is man or men. The root word meaning having thoughts or having intelligence. So human, the word in itself means dirt with intelligence. So, what's the what? so what gives the dirt intelligence? What gives the dirt intelligence? The spirit. If you don't believe me, look at what happens to your body when the spirit leaves. What happens? It goes back to the dirt. Is it inanimate? When the brain is dead, the spirit leaves. The body is just dirt. It's just like the Matrix. You ever see the Matrix? And they're plugged into the Matrix and they just pull the thing out. What happens to the body? And it just fell. It killed you. The spirit was jacked in to the body which allowed them to function and move within the Matrix. And when they were separated from that spirit, the body died. Same thing like Avatar. Another great, another great movie, Avatar. When the machine started glitching and in the middle he was running, this fell out. Because without the consciousness, without the spirit, the body is useless. And so you, human, man or woman, are not your body. Your bo a human is dirt that has thoughts. Dirt that has intelligence. Wow. Come on. Thanks. You're a spirit. No, so, so, no, so don't value, the reason why I say that is, then you shouldn't value yourself by your dirt. Yep. No matter what shade it is, whether you have light dirt, 
Browner, Browner, Slacker, Kinder. Don't judge yourself by the dirt. Judge yourself by the spirits. Come on, bro. You're a spirit. And so, what we have to do, so, so in order to understand that we're a vessel for God, and what would really keeps us from failing to understand that we're vessels for God, is that the dirt gets in the way. So in order to live as a spirit, you have to get rid of the dirt. You have to move the dirt, clear the dirt out. So how do we do this? Fasting. Jesus says the body is more than what? Food. How do we do this? Fasting. Prayer and fast. Let's go to John chapter 6. John chapter 6, again, I, I, I'm studying this out, and I'm going back to some, some scriptures I've been looking at for years, and it's like a whole new Bible. It's fascinating. It's not like those teachings weren't already there. It just, it just wasn't relevant to me. It's the way that it is now. John chapter 6, and verse 16. Amen when you get there. Amen. So this is Jesus speaking. In verse 6 he says, On hearing, on hearing it, many of his disciples said, This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? See, fasting is a hard teaching. Right? Denying the flesh is a hard teaching. Finding out that your body is just dirt, and you're not your dirt, but you're a spirit. That's a hard teaching. On hearing this, they said, This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? But what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. It's me, amen. <laughs> the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life, that there are some of you. Who do not believe. See, there's some of us that do not believe or have not decided to live according to the true nature as a spirit because of the hard teaching of what it means to really deny the flesh. It's not an elementary teaching. This is a very challenging teaching for many of us to really go beyond the surface to really live according to the spirit. What is Jesus saying here? Real simple. Jesus is saying, guys, you guys are worried about bread to feed your eyes. Your ancestors, they had bread. Matter of fact, we, I gave my, my father gave bread from heaven, and they ate their full. But they died in the desert. Your ancestors died anyway. I'm telling you to feed the spirit. He says, my words have life. Feed your spirit. How do we feed our spirit? This is where Bible study, prayer, and fasting are so important. You guys with me this morning? Come on. Yeah. All right, this is not some. It's not. This is not a cookie cutter stuff here. This is Bible study stuff. You feed your spirit with the word. That's why Bible study is so important. He says, "My word is full of life." The depths of the wisdom of God. He's saying, his word says, I'm a spirit. Watch what happens when I go back to where I was before. See, when they crucified Jesus, he went down into hell to free the souls there. Then he ascended into heaven, opened up the gates of heaven, and then he came to resurrect the body. So Jesus didn't come back in a spirit form. He came back fully in flesh as a man to show that the spirit has power over the flesh. Mm -hmm. Come on, bro. And that's why it says, death, where's your sting? There's no victory in death anymore. Because Jesus proved once and for all that the spirit trumps the flesh. Come on, bro. And he defeats the spirit. And as a result of this teaching, many of his disciples stopped following him. Yeah. When you said this chapter out for yourself, many of his disciples, they grumble. Said, no, no, it's too crazy. Kick rocks. And they left him because they did not believe this kingdom principle. See, Jesus says the flesh is nothing, the spirit is everything. The flesh says 
Jesus is a liar. Jesus is a liar, says the flesh. And the thing I want to challenge is again, I just want to make a big deal about it. I just want to put this tool that you're disposed to a store. That's why fasting is such a powerful tool. Because fasting reveals who's right. You want to know if Jesus is telling the truth or not? Quiet the flesh. Yeah. Yeah. Quiet the flesh. And watch what happens. Mm -hmm. See, this, is what fast, this is what fasting does. Fasting subdues the flesh. It quiets it. You know, your body's talking to you right now. Your body's telling you, I'm tired. I got the itis. I need another cup of coffee. <laughs> I'm still hungry. I didn't get enough of that, uh, that, um, uh, whatever's over there now. <laughs> there's nothing left. <laughs> Your stomach's talking about that, too. Your book wants man, there's nothing left, man. We should have more food. It's grumbling right now. So your, so your yeah. flesh is so loud, you can't even hear the spirit. Mm -hmm. It overwhelms you. It controls you. Your flesh talks to you. Fasting subdues the flesh. That's why when Jesus was baptized, the first thing he did for 40 days was what? Yeah. Fast. He completely put the flesh into submission. And I, you know, you know, you can fact check me on this, but a human being's capacity for going without food, guess what it is? I give you one guess. It's 40 days. After 40 days, your body begins to eat itself. It begins to eat the muscles and affecting your function. As little as the human capacity before you start dying. And so that's the challenging thing here is that no one in the Bible fasted more than 40 days. Nope. But what did Jesus do? He pushed to the absolute limit of human capacity without sin because he wouldn't damage his own body on purpose. That would be sin. But he pushed to limits to show that no, the, the, the man is not living off of bread alone, but from the very word of God. Mm -hmm. And I think that that revelation allowed Jesus, in a, in a, even though he was spirit, in a, in a human body, to, to re-emphasize and encourage him that his spirit was stronger than the flesh and allow him to live the powerful life that he did, even to submit to death on the cross. Why do you think he's able to give his life up? Because he realized that he had that victory under his belt, realized that the spirit is greater than the flesh. Wow. You know, fasting optimizes our bodies, because it is a vessel. It optimizes our body to be a conduit for the spirits. It's like a pipe. You imagine a, a clogged up pipe and the water, you know, the water goes down slow but the drain is slow. And so you brush your teeth and it goes down and it still goes down, right? It's gross, right? And so it doesn't push the gunk down. It just kind of squeezes through in the best way that it can until what? Until it no longer squeezes through it and it's gross and you, and you get the drain on it. Right? You would be there. It's no, longer, it's no longer a pipe. It's no longer a, a free flowing vessel for the water. Yeah. Well, the Spirit of God is like water, and it flows through us. And so, when, we, when our when our body and our flesh is so loud and so clogged up, it's no longer a free flowing vessel. So you can get by with prayer and Bible study and still be spiritual and still get the Spirit will come through you. And you'll be able to function and get, get some things by, but there's some things that you won't be able to do. Now, without prayer and fasting, there's certain things that you need more spiritual flow to accomplish. I'm trying to help us out with this mission team, guys. Are you with the mission team? Yeah. There's certain things that we're trying to accomplish here that unless we get serious, and, we, and it's serious that the Bible is real. It's not a joke. I'm not talking in theory. we got to get serious that the Bible is real, and this is a real spiritual battle. And we have to believe that, is, is Jesus a liar or not? Yeah. When he said the flesh counts for nothing, the spirit gives life. Mm. And so if, if we believe that, and we're living as citizens of the kingdom of God, and as soldiers in the army of God, then we need to arm ourselves appropriately. Yeah. And we need to train. I'm not saying that we're going to go 40 days from day one, but I'm, I'm asking you and challenging you to explore the deeper spiritual things and the teachings of the wisdom of God. Are you with me? Yeah. Um, amen. Come on. As we close out here, I'm sorry, I know that we're a little longer, but I think it's so important for us to do battle in a spiritual realm. How can you do battle with demonic forces when you can't even do battle with your belly? Right. 
if you can't get your stomach to yield, how are you going to get demonic forces to yield? Come on, bro. How are you going to overcome your own sin, let alone drive out the sin in another person's life? without understanding that the spirit is everything. Again, as we close out here, I want to leave us with this. Faith and joy in the kingdom of God is tied into these three very simple but, very, but unlimited uh, sources of exploration for God. Number one is that we need to see that we're the objects of God's affection. Really explore and accept and embrace the fact that God, God loves you immensely. God has great love for you and great love for all mankind. God doesn't show favoritism. He, he loves those that are in church this morning. He loves those that haven't read the scripture in their life. He strays is what he called them. And he's waiting for he's waiting for us to bring them back to the flock. Amen? Amen. And I think that as you embrace that. It'll be all over you as you share your faith about the love of God. It will draw people to it. And I, again, I, well, I have to commend you again for your amazing, amazing communion. Is that as humans, we are starved and we're searching for deep love, affection, and true acceptance. And that's who God is. God is all about love. He's all about restoration. He's all about accepting us, but he accepts those who are humble. He accepts those that are willing to walk humbly with him. So that's point number one. Point number two I want to leave you with is that the wisdom of God reveals our true identity. I want to challenge you and explore, are you living as a kingdom citizen? Or are you living on, a, on an expiring visa, hoping to stay illegally? I guarantee you, no one has been able to do it yet. When your visa is up, and so I think well, that's one of the cool benefits that I think we're talking about. The God wants you to take care of your body. That's why your, your body is so important because without a body, there's no vessel for the spirit, for good or for evil. Because, you know, Satan, Satan needs vessels too. He's the spirit too. So he needs to influence people who are susceptible to his message or his will, as well as God is looking for those who are open and susceptible as vessels for his will. Amen. So decide which kingdom you are, you are a citizen of. And fight for your kingdom. And the last point, again, is that we need to live as vessels for the Holy Spirit, the most powerful force in the universe. And I think that's an exciting thing that your body is able to contain and as a conduit and a direction of a flow of the Holy Spirit. I think this is awesome. Mm -hmm. And if you can't get excited about that, then what is this? All right? Get your fire started on that. Get home. The most powerful force in the universe wants to flow through you. And to use you, you just have to allow it and open yourself up to it. And I hope to encourage you and inspire you to explore that for the rest of your life. It's God. Amen. Amen.